Welcome everyone and thank you for joining today's webinar on 717. My name is Jobin Abraham, Director of Learning and Capacity Development at Resolve to Save Lives, and I will be your moderator today. Over the next hour, you will hear about real-world applications of the 717, of 717 in Uganda as a performance improvement tool, and the WHO Africa Office's vision for leveraging it as part of their regional strategy. This is meant to be an interactive dialogue with you, and we want to make sure that there's time to discuss your questions. So to help us stay connected, here are some housekeeping items. For our Francophone colleagues, Pour la traduction simultanée en français, veuillez utiliser le menu Interprétation en bas de votre écran. Pour suivre les diapositives en français, veuillez cliquer sur le lien dans la boîte de discussion. Simultaneous translation is available in French for this webinar. Please use the Q&A function to post your questions as they arise. We will bring these up during the Q&A segments of our conversation. So the big question on our minds right now is, why is 717 important for the world? To help us answer that question, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Tom Frieden, President and CEO of Resolve to Save Lives. Over to you, Dr. Frieden. Thank you so much, Jobin, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. I'm really excited for this webinar. 717 is an approach that builds on and complements many aspects of preparedness. The International Health Regulations, or our IHR, remain foundational for health protection. The Joint External Evaluations, or JEE, remain a core means to assess and track progress and help every country develop a specific plan for improvement. Groups such as Ending Pandemics have emphasized the importance of timeliness metrics and the utility of after-action reports. These timeliness metrics were adopted by the World Health Organization as part of its triple billion metric, and 717 addresses the need for a timeliness metric as part of the WHO triple billion framework. 717 has emerged from partnerships among many entities, most importantly, work with countries in Africa and elsewhere, which have demonstrated not just commitment, but also real progress, improving preparedness and have refined and identified the benefits of the 717 approach. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown the world what's at stake, literally millions of lives and trillions of dollars. So what is 717? It's a way of measuring and rapidly improving the detection, recognition, and response to every suspected outbreak. 717 has three main functions. First, and most importantly, rapid and continuous quality improvement. Second, advocacy and communication. And third, accountability. Through analyzing where a system performs slower, stakeholders can identify weak points and assess areas for improvement. These may be technical capacities, surveillance, laboratory systems, emergency operations. They may be governance, leadership, decision-making, coordination, multi-sectoral collaboration, communication and community engagement. When a 717 analysis is done, strengths and weaknesses become apparent. The weaknesses can often be fixed with a different approach than we've used in the past, an approach that says simply, find a problem, fix a problem. Not all problems can be fixed that simply, but the 717 also focuses attention on issues that do require longer term commitment, things like improving primary healthcare systems. The approach continues to be developed based on deep partnership with countries. And today, we're very much looking forward to hearing from Dr. Issa Mukombi, Manager of the Public Health Emergency Operations Center and Deputy Director of the National Institute of Public Health in Uganda, and Dr. Ambrose Talisuna, Senior Health Security Advisor with WHO Africa Region. And now over to Dr. Mukombi. Thank you very much, Dr. Fredin, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, 717 uh, for performance improvement in Uganda. And I'm going to tell you why really we are excited for, on, for this tool. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, your preparedness in Uganda is so important because uh, we, in the last decade, we are getting public emergency uh, outbreaks back to back. And so Uganda is very prone to 
public health emergencies. Uh, okay, let me start my video. Is it my video on now? Yes, it is. Thank you very much. Very good. Very good. Uh, so I was I was saying that uh, it is very important for us in Uganda really to prepare and to be ready uh, both in both in capacity and capabilities because we are very vulnerable, uh, especially because of our geographical location. We are near the Congo Basin, where is the a rich, which is a rich and a pool of uh, new and emerging uh, pathogens. We are in the belt of meningitis. We are in the belt of uh, viral hemorrhagic fevers like Ebola, Marburg. Uh, we have frequent influx uh, of refugees. Uh, we are our our ecosystem is being encroached on and being uh, uh, sometimes degraded. So we really we are really going nearer and nearer to these pathogens. Uh, some of it is global globalization, growing population. And so on, so on. So all of these really make us very vulnerable to public health emergencies, and that's why we need to be ready to cope with these back-to-back -back, uh, public health emergencies from these uh, uh, factors. Next slide, please. So uh, Dr. Trimble has uh, has already talked about the the seven one seven milestones and the timeliness metric. This is a metric which really is, is very exciting and helps us, for us, try to improve on our, the way we manage, uh, the way we detect, the way we respond uh, to, to outbreaks, which are, as I've already told you, are back to back. From COVID, as you know, we went to Ebola. We had just come from anthrax. So really this, this uh, uh, instrument or tool or metric is very, very critical for us. Uh, because it makes us improve every day. And as you know, the room for improvement, nobody can ever feel it. So uh, the targets, um, 717, seven, the first seven stands for the time it takes to detect an outbreak. Uh, this is a range. It could be two days, it could be uh, four days, six days, but at least it should be within seven days. You should have really in a system which is working very well and robust, one should have detect, detected an outbreak. And it should take only one day or less than one day to inform or to notify the authorities so that they can take appropriate decisions and action uh, to control the outbreak, maybe at source. And the other one is the last seven is the time to start or to mount uh, a response so that you can uh, start immediately. Uh, here in Uganda, we say driving at a very high speed can kill, but in, in, in epidemics, uh, speed can save life. And that's why we want to see that we are within those uh, targets so that you know we increase our speed. Next slide, please. So uh, the way we implement 717, uh, is really, uh, this 717 really is domiciled in the National Public Health Emergency Operation Center, which I had. And also we have tried to scale it up to other three regional uh, EOCs. And these EOCs, we have trained them um, in how to collect the data and fit this in this metric so that we can see where there's systemic problems or bottlenecks and we are the systemic enablers. And these, um, this, this data, which is the, uh, incorporated in the metric, uh, the 717, is later on presented to the National Task Force uh, meetings to discuss bottlenecks and propose remedial actions. Uh, the National Task Force is the one which is, is a multi-sectoral, uh, multidisciplinary committee which oversees uh, the, the response of an outbreak. So we dis these are discussed and the bottlenecks are well uh, elaborated for everybody to see because this is a, the National Task Force is government plus partners. Next slide, next slide, please. Uh-huh. Now, I, I think I want to give an example so that you can, you can get a feel 
uh, I, I just want to make wet your appetite on 717. How we utilize it for the current e EVD, which is going on right now, although we are almost at the tail end. This one, this EVD started in Mobende district. And you can see uh, uh, the target is seven days, but when we applied 717, we found that we had taken more than a month to detect this outbreak. It was far away in the rural area. It took us some time really to detect. However, uh, when we detected it, it took us only one day to notify and took us nine days to start mounting an, a, an effective response. Now, the data we collect uh, is when did we detect this? And what were the bottlenecks if we didn't hit the first seven? Why didn't we detect within the first seven days? And the bottlenecks here, I just want to give an example again, is that we found that there was lack of uh, IDSR knowledge uh, and case definition in the private facilities. Actually, what happened, uh, patients were getting this disease and you know they were saturating the private clinics and the private clinics had no knowledge, no case definition, uh, and that's why they, we delayed to detect it. However, when one of the patients uh, came to the public facility, it was quickly detected because the public is well, is well trained and they are well trained in syndromic uh, surveillance and they know the definitions of these, some of these uh, outbreaks. So it was easy for us in the public to do that, whereas in the private, it delayed there. So uh, what were the remedial action? We had immediate remedial action that the private was, there was a big gap in the private in Mubende. So we immediately did sensitize the private uh, clinics in Mubende district so that it can be part of the response. They can identify patients if they come to their clinics or to their establishment so that it can be part of the response and identification and contact, contact tracing. So that was an immediate uh, remedy uh, of that bottleneck of a gap in the private sector in that rural area. And of course the remedial action we took. However, again, we decided that the long term, we may need to train all the private providers uh, in IDSR so that they are, we are on the same page. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we have also done, looked at, uh, applied this metric 717 uh, to about 48, <clears throat> excuse me, 48 events from January to November this year. And we have found that 17% of these uh, 48 uh, events, as I told you, back to back outbreaks here in Uganda met the targets of 717 and the, and, the, and the others, uh, 51 met the target for detection, uh, 79 met the target for notification and 47 met the target for, uh, for response. That means really uh, this, there, there, are, there were bottlenecks why we're not hitting the, these targets. Next. Slide, please. So we collected all these from these 48 events. We collected all the, the bottlenecks and uh, enablers and, uh, and remedial action proposed. Uh, again, I'll give one example. Uh, inability to apply case definition in private, uh, private facilities and conduct and remedial action conducting a, a training in, in, in IDSR and in the private sector. That was very quick. We did that very quickly for the short term in Mubende in particular, and then for the whole country in the long term. Next slide, please. So uh, we, we have a national action plan for health security. And we found that uh, uh, the national plan is huge. If you don't really take slices, you find it very difficult to, to, to implement it. So we decided to do what we call annual operational plans for, national, for the plan for national action, action plan for health security, where we first do the assessment, evaluate, and then do the planning, implement, and then 
monitor, and of course, the circle continues. So recommended long-term remedial actions from 717 were combined with other evaluations like for IHR, M and E, uh, after action review, JEE, uh, state party annual reports to, to form a list of activities. And of course, then we had to prioritize those activities uh, and included them in our annual uh, operational work plan. Next, next slide, please. So after doing, after, after using this uh, metric and looking at those bottlenecks and incorporating them in our uh, annual operational plan. And as, as the Dr. Friend has said, this 717 looks at the whole system. It could be governance, could be a pillar of like surveillance, it could be transport. So it looks at the whole systemic uh, domain so that you, nothing is not, it, it kind of illuminates the whole, the whole uh, public health management system so that every, every angle is looked at and we don't leave anything. Uh, and and uh, we turn, it's turning all the tables to see that all the uh, bottlenecks are really identified. So 717, what we have learned, target provides a useful framework that identify bottlenecks and action that lead to improvement performance. Because why we are not hitting the targets of 7147, there is some gaps and these gaps need to be addressed to improve performance. Using 717 also in real time, we identify action necessary to improve even the ongoing response, as I've told you, we immediately found that we had to sensitize those uh, uh, private sector in Mubende so that they could help us in the ongoing response. 717 complements the existing uh, IHR monitoring and evaluation framework by identifying systemic bottlenecks in real time, in real time, because as you, as you, are, as you are investigating, as you are verifying, you are identifying uh, bottlenecks. 717 data was used to prioritize activities and to, for better allocation of resources uh, in our latest annual uh, work, work plan. And of course, uh, we are very happy that 717 supports our approach of IDSR, which we for a long time have been using this uh, to make sure that we can manage, manage our uh, public emergency. Uh, problems or outbreaks. Next slide, please. We have some recommendations. This recommendation for successful implementation, we need to try to train rapid response teams to capture data or timeliness or information, especially the bottlenecks, why we are not hitting the targets of this framework. And of course, incorporate this 717 uh, to a stockholder meeting to convene, which we convened recently and, uh, and enable immediate resolution of, of, of those bottlenecks as we do in the National Task Force. We discuss it them and we make, we find the resolution immediately, those which are immediate, long-term and short-term. And they need to engage uh, regional EOCs so that they can also uh, apply this uh, metric for for smaller events so that they capture data for the small events at regional EOC. 717 implementation highlighted the need for data system to capture uh, the timeliness of this, of, this, of this metrics, which for us was very, very critical. Next, please. So the next steps we think, uh, uh, what, what we are doing now, we are continuing to review in, in real time in, at the national uh, national task force meetings, the seven one seven uh, outputs, what it gives us and what it brings out as a way of improvement. Because what now, since we've been using this, there is continuous improvement in our performance in the way we manage uh, these outbreaks. We want to expand uh, to regional other regional EOCs. Uh, to review 
performance, of course, for those smaller events. Uh, we are now discussing with the Office of the Prime Minister uh, and One Health Platform uh, to review that of 717 for all hazards, all hazards, because the OPM is the one in charge of disasters in this country, mainly when there is landslide, when there is floods, when there is earthquake. So we think this is something also we need maybe to uh, incorporate in all hazard in all our hazard plan, especially at the office of the prime minister. And the office of the prime minister is that's where the the coordination of our national action plan for security is domiciled. So this we think is going to be very helpful. We wish to integrate 717 timeless metric into our event management system, which is being deployed in DHIS2. And I hope this will be very helpful. Our recommendation really is that uh, other countries or other members could also begin implementing this and uh, so that they can also harness the value, uh, the value added by this uh, metric. Next, I think that my, was my last slide. I thank you very much. But in a summary, in a summary, these metrics help us to find bottlenecks which we we can immediately uh, uh, resolve during a, an outbreak, or which we can incorporate in our annual uh, operational work plan. And we think this is also giving us continuous improvement in performance, quality improvement, those who know about quality improvement. This is one of the tools. I thank you very much for listening to me. I submit. Dr. Mokumbi, thank you so much for that um, very succinct and powerful primer on 717. Dr. Mokumbi, if you can stay on camera, now we'll have about, uh, we have five to seven minutes of, um, of uh, Q&A, and I feel like I have the toughest job uh, here today because there's so many questions that have come in both around the technical assumptions of this model, the real world application, advocacy uh, and political implications. So we'll have to prioritize the questions today for, I'll group some of our questions and present it to you today. And our team will follow up um, separately with all the, to make sure that all the key questions are answered within the next few days for sure. So to well, get us started. I, I didn't come alone. <laughs> I came with Aaron and, and Lydia whom we have been uh, in thick and thin of this um, metric. So they, they'll be able so to help me to answer some of the, the questions. I hope they are on now. Thank you. Excellent. Um, yes, well, we'll pose the questions. And if we need to bring up uh, someone, uh, we'll see if we, we have enough time to bring in uh, Aaron and, uh, and Lydia. Um, all right, so the first question is, well, what do we mean when we say initial response in the first seven days? How did uh, you and your team interpret and uh, use that? Uh, in the initial response is that uh, we, we start mobilizing, mobilizing the response structures. Are you ready to, to start like, a, like, a, like the National Task Force? has to sit immediately and, and appoint uh, an incident commander and an incident team. That really is for us is the beginning of the response. And of course, informing the districts uh, about the results and also sending a rapid response team to really verify and also start preliminary control measures. That's what I mean. Excellent. And then if you could help us understand Dr. Makumbi on a day-to-day -day basis, how has this tool been useful for you? Have you been able to use this in terms of political engagement and advocacy? What does that look like? Yeah, as uh, uh, again, as you know, in, in the National Task Force, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a composition of government officials uh, where ministers uh, sit and of course partners. Uh, so so they, 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 they get to hear about this. Uh, and also recently, we have presented this to the ministerial meeting in Seoul. And mm. uh, they, were, they were very, very happy. The ministers were very happy about this, uh, the, this metric in Seoul. It was a high level ministerial meeting. So the political uh, level 
has caught fire on this. Thank you. And in those conversations, I'm sure this is on all of our minds on the political piece, uh, in those conversations, what concerns um, do people or countries possibly have about what do we do if the data doesn't look good? I think that, that is a red flag for us. Mm. If the data doesn't look well, that's the red flag. Because then you know there's that a lot of work ahead of you. What we want, as I told you, speed in public health emergency saves life. So mm. the more you delay, the more lives you lose, the more economy you you, dip, you, you, you destroy, and the more life you could, you, you, you know, you or forego. Excellent. Thank you for that important framing from a leadership perspective about how this uh, this metric can be used effectively and appropriately uh, for accountability and advocacy. Uh, the next question I have for us is, what was the was the animal health sector involved? What was their involvement like in this space? In this in this uh, in this uh, use of the metric. Pardon. The animal health sector. What was their involvement like in this work? Uh, the animal, the animal sector, for example, for EVD, not very much. But now also we have now uh, CCHF, RVF, uh, so the animal animal sector is fully involved. And they, actually, the instant commander is a veterinarian officer. Sorry, I'm just looking at the questions. Give me a moment. So if you can build on that a little bit more um, about the animal health sector piece, how does the One Health approach, because a lot of us on the line are quite committed to the One Health approach, and we know Uganda is as well, how does the One Health approach feature in the metric, and what is the target uh, host for the detection stage? Um, uh, yes. As I said, we are now discussing with the office of the prime minister, which is in, in really is the lead agency for all disasters. And we want to make sure that uh, 717 features in uh, all hazard plans. So, and all hazard plans, one health it really is very critical. Very critical, as you know, the way to go these days is multi-sectoral uh, approach, whole of society, whole of government. So this is that we are now doing exactly, this is what we are discussing now. How do we, uh, make sure that this uh, 717 is integrated or is institutionalized in this uh, uh, One Health approach and in this uh, 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 multi-hazard plan we have. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Makumbi. Uh, we have to now transition to the next part of our conversation, but clearly there are a lot of questions that have come up. Uh, what, we will, what our team will attempt to do is try to answer some of those questions uh, via the Q&A function, the ones that we couldn't get to, and the rest we will try to uh, package and respond to all the people who uh, are sweep for this webinar. We'll try to answer those questions because there are a lot of questions in the chat about the, the model that was used to develop this and a lot of technical questions. We look forward to coming back to you on that. But for now, let's transition to our next speaker for today. Thank you so much, Dr. Makumbi. Uh, Dr. Ambrose Talisuna, uh, let's welcome him the, uh, to introduce us to how the Africa WHO Africa Regional Office is uh, leveraging this as part of their regional strategy. Over to you, Ambrose. Thanks, Jobin, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be joining us for this well, very important webinar. My name is uh, Ambrose Talisuna, and as you heard from Tom, um, Senior Advisor, Health Security, with the WHO liaison office uh, to the African Union and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. And I would really like to, to, to look at uh, how we are using 717 to strengthen health security in Africa. So I'm just going to give the perspective of, of Africa. Next slide. And this is the context. If you really look at the context, and you've heard from Makumbi giving you uh, just a one country perspective, each year in the African region, we see more than 100 emergencies, humanitarian crisis, infectious disease outbreaks. And at the moment, in fact, actually this data, 126 disease outbreaks are ongoing, including COVID, monkeypox, vaccine, preventable diseases like polio, measles. Over 22 million people are at risk of starvation in the greater Horn of Africa. 
33 million people in six countries in the Sahel need humanitarian assistance. They needed humanitarian assistance in the first quarter of 2022. And 17 million people on the African region are displaced. So we really need to prepare across all hazards, infectious diseases, humanitarian crisis. Next slide, please. So we need a strong emergency capabilities around the world. And we have had recent global recommendations 10 proposals to strengthen health emergency preparedness and resilience. We had the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response made seminal recommendations that were discussed in the World Working Group on Pandemic Preparedness at the 75th World Health Assembly recently in May. We also had the Independent Oversight and Advisory Committee recommendations, but also the IHR Review Committee recommendations. And some of these recommendations are leading to targeted amendments to the international health regulations. Some of the recommendations are for us to establish a new pandemic treaty, pandemic convention, which has been already being discussed now by the intergovernmental neg negotiating body. Next slide. So in the African region, based on these recommendations, drawing lessons from COVID-19, drawing lessons from Ebola in West Africa, 2013-2016, we've developed a regional strategy for health security, 2022-2030. And this was endorsed by the health ministers at the Lomi Regional Committee, and all countries endorsed this regional strategy. So on the next slide, I'm going to give you some insights of what is in this regional strategy. Next slide, please. Our regional strategy in the Africa region is underpinned on three critical flagship initiatives. We call them flagship initiatives. And I'll start from the extreme end. We have a flagship initiative on what we've called PREPARE. And this is really, we are given it the acronym, Promoting Resilience of Systems for Emergencies. This is where we will have Antia six pillars, evidence-based policies and legislation. So issues that might arise, we might need new legislation, for example, when we have the pandemic treaty. We might have to do repeat joint external evaluations. We might have to do after action reviews, for example, like Uganda now after the SVD outbreak, we need to do an after action review. But after we do those assessments, we need to review the national action plan for health security, and we need to develop a new operational plans. The second pillar is called DETECT, and we're calling this transforming Africa's surveillance systems. And here we have a couple of pillars. Um, one of the pillars is really support countries to develop uh, and scale up IDSR. IDSR, Integrated Disease Surveillance and Response, we've been implementing it for over 20 years. But we need to transform IDSR. We need to use digital tools more. We need to train people, workforce for IDSR. We need to digitize the system. We need high-level advocacy to mobilize resources. But this IDSR at countries really needs to be linked to a global public health surveillance system which has both indicator and event-based surveillance. We need pathogen surveillance system. We need genomic surveillance. Actually, COVID-19 has taught this, but if you look at my drug resistant TB, we need to be doing molecular, molecular surveillance. And then the final one, which deals with response, also has uh, four pillars. And here we have a pillar on readiness, response, and coordination. You have heard Isa talking about emergency operation centers. That might be for small countries, but also national public health institutes. And our colleagues at Africa CDC are driving this agenda. And Tom, Tom published an issue recently on the importance of national public health institutes. Several countries might need those ones. But we need risk communication and community engagement before, during, and after the outbreak. And then operational support and logistics. On the African continent, we were short changed during COVID. Initially, we didn't have personal protective equipment. Initially, we didn't even have diagnostics. When vaccines became available, we are not having all the vaccines that we required. So we really need to be looking at how do we deal with reposition supplies? How do we deal with R&D to have countermeasures? And then workforce, workforce development during an outbreak. We need to have trained incident managers. We need laboratorians. We need anthropologists. We need epidemiologists, but across the board, I was in Zambia and South Africa during the first waves and the second waves of COVID-19 and mental health, mental health experts. People really need mental health and psychosocial support, but we have very few of those experts. 
We don't have logisticians. Most of our logisticians at the moment are repurposed storekeepers. We need to be working with training institutions to see that we are churning out these people in pre-service training schools. And that will require workforce strategies in peacetime, but also having the workforce strategies that can respond rapid, multidisciplinary response teams and emergency management teams. Next slide. So we also have to support those three flagship initiatives, cross-cutting work streams. And one of them is really to continue to institutionalize accountability, monitoring and evaluation. And we know the International Health Regulation Monitoring and Evaluation Framework, which has the, four, the one mandatory component, the state party annual report, and the voluntary joint and evaluation. Many of the countries now did their joint and evaluation more than five years ago. These countries need to be doing repeat joint and evaluations. At the end of the outbreak, for example, like I said in Uganda, we need to test the functionality of those systems using after action reviews. During COVID-19, we have also done interaction reviews. But in the absence of events, we need to test whether the systems we are developing are functional. So we need to do simulations and exercises. The other second cross-cutting work stream that is going to support our flagship initiatives is strengthening community systems, community resilience as it were, having a community-based IDSR routine community dialogue, working with trusted community actors and local leaders to educate communities and making communities part and parcel of the response, part and parcel of the emergency preparedness and response cycle from prevention, preparedness, readiness, detection, response and recovery. But we need to invest in innovation, research and development. We need new life-saving countermeasures, vaccines, diagnostics, therapeutics. At the moment, you know, the Sudan virus, Ebola, which is ongoing in Uganda, I mean, we don't have a treatment, we don't have a vaccine. We had that for the Zaire. We need to be looking at that and developing that. During COVID, we didn't have vaccines. Luckily, with collaborations, there was really ramp up pipeline to develop vaccines in record time. But even then, putting vaccines in the arms of people We've had vaccine hesitancy, so we really need to be looking at some of these things. But for R&D, we need to have synergy and close collaboration with national, regional, and research institutes. And for our regional strategy 2022-2030, we've actually included this component to adopt and use this novel global 717 target that Dr. Makumbi has been talking about. Identify the outbreak within seven days of emergence. That requires having epidemiologists who are trained at the periphery. It requires you to have good laboratory systems and uh, from the periphery, maybe refer of samples to the reference laboratory, but also to report to public health officials within one day. Now, epidemics start in communities. They have to be reported and so that we can amount, amount a response. But then we need to initiate an effective response within those seven days. Countries then have to develop a response plan. You have to set up a coordination mechanism. And as you probably in, in the first seven days, like Dr. Makumbi has been saying. Next slide. So how does 717 complement these flagship initiatives? And I'm just going to just give you in the next couple of minutes, look at pros, promoting response of systems for emergencies. Here we want member states to be prepared. They have to have systems in place resilient systems, and they are compliant to meet global standards. So 717 helps to translate learnings from real world events and to prioritize national action plans. Post Ebola in West Africa, we developed national action plan for health security, which we call NAPS, across 19 areas. These plans are very complex. We need to make them simplified. And at the moment for these flagships we are developing, 24 month country uh, roadmaps so that we take priorities within priorities so that the national action plans don't scare away external financing, but also that they can help us to mobilize internal financing. The next, if you look, the linkages is starts transforming African surveillance systems. Here we want to strengthen epidemiological surveillance to prevent. But if you look at that, 717 could help us to assess 
the functioning of the integrated disease surveillance and response performance. And so it will lead to performance improvement, like my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Makumbi was saying, and uh, uh, Dr. Tom Frieden. Now for supporting use of response groups or emergencies, we're working with our colleagues on the African uh, AVOX from Africa CDC, because we really don't want to have parallel system. Here we want to have a member state having a multidisciplinary team, depending on the size, at least 50 people ready to deploy. If you're in Nigeria or Ethiopia, like now, you might actually need, need 100 or even 150 multidisciplinary experts that need, to be, that need to be trained. And we need to look at how we retain those people, especially when we are peacetime. And how does 717 help us to do that? It's really accountability and visibility for effective and early response to contain public health emergency. Because if we really have incident management systems that can be activated very quickly, then we can initiate the response within the first seven days. Next slide, please. What about integrated disease surveillance and response? As I said, the IDSR strategy was adopted by our regional committee in the late, 19, the late 90s, actually 1998 to 1999. IDSR is implemented by almost all African member states as a common approach to the detection of public health threats with appropriate reporting. 717 actually we've looked at, we've done a crosswalk, is aligned with the targets for detection or notification of outbreaks in IDSR. 717 also can be used to assess how the IDSR system is performing in achieving its goals to detect, to respond to threats across. And finally, 717 can identify action that can be taken to strengthen IDSR. So moving forward, performance improvement for improving IDSR and transforming Africa's surveillance systems under TAS. Next slide. So to sum up really, I want to, to really uh, say colleagues, from the H1, H1N1 pandemic in 1918, to Ebola in West Africa, to the COVID-19 pandemic, epidemics and pandemics have always had devastating health, social and economic impacts. We cannot predict with certainty which pathogen will cause the next pandemic. It may be respiratory, it may be a contagion, it may be waterborne, we don't know. But if humans and infectious disease pathogens continue to coexist, pandemics are likely to occur. COVID-19 has definitely showed us that we need to be prepared now, not tomorrow, to mitigate the effects of the next pandemic. And for us, we really need to build, building capacity for health security, which is integrated with building resilient health system, a system that is able to respond to any shock event, whether that shock event is a contagion, whether that shock event is a zoonotic event, whether that shock event is a vaccine preventable disease, whether that shock event is a vector borne disease, or whether that shock event is just antimicrobial resistance. So we really need systems that can be able to deal with uh, those shock events. And at Afro, we have adopted this in our regional strategy because we believe 717 adds to our accountability measures on how to gauge how African countries are building health security and resilient health systems. I thank you for your attention and I can take some questions now. Thank you very much for joining us for this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Kumbi. Excellent, thank you so much. I see the questions for Dr. Uh, Talisuna are coming in. Um, so if you can, all of you, if you can add your questions specific to uh, the presentation about um, the Afro strategy with 717, please put them in right now. But to get us started, I'll ask a question to Dr. Talasuna, which is we've uh, today, as we've talked about 717 with multiple countries, one thing we've often gotten as a question is, does 717 replace IHR framework or how does it fit in with the IHR framework uh, to complement it? Um, would love to hear your response to that. I think the 717, as I said, it's, and we, we in our cross-cutting work stream, you've seen the regional strategy. We, we've really noted that 717 adds, it complements on that. And if you look at the way we do after action reviews, for example, mm. done after action reviews, normally uh, you, you want to do them within three months at the end of the outbreak. 
717 will do this in real time so that you can start tweaking things when the outbreak probably is ongoing. And if you heard from ESA, for example, there are certain things that normally even funders don't want. If you look at, say, you know, a district rapid response team tells you they don't have transport or fuel to go and respond to an to go and uh, deploy. Those are things that 717 can identify and you tweak it within the, in real time to be able to actually reduce the timelines of responding to an outbreak. And then things like, I mean, a peripheral health worker doesn't have airtime to communicate to the next level. You tweak that in real time and they can resolve that. That would have actually waited one month, two months, or three mm. months after they have to action review to do that. Now, the joint external evaluation, for example, is done every four or five years. So you have to wait for another four to five years for you to be able to identify whether you change these capacities. 717 helps you to see these gaps when the, when the event is occurring. The third party annual report, for example, which we've really modified recently and the reporting has improved, also is done at the end of, 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 of every year. And we've learning from the joint and evaluation, we're trying to bring together different sectors. I had a colleague asking, is this a one health approach? We are definitely stri struggling, we're striving to, for that from a coordination mechanism at national level to the peripheral level. We want to look at this. So 717 definitely complements the existing IHR monitoring and evaluation framework, but also other system assessments. And in our strategy, for example, we are introducing resilience assessments, which were never there previously. Excellent. Thank you so much. Another question we've just received is, how is WHO working with member states to achieve 717 goal? Is there a generic roadmap uh, that's being developed that countries can start to adopt? So now, I think now we draw lessons from the, these countries that have uh, uh, implemented 717, Uganda, Nigeria, and trying to learn from those lessons. And now that we've included the 717 uh, in, um, in uh, to be adopted or adapted by member states. The next is really for us to quickly have some kind of uh, operational guidance tool that then helps countries to scale up. Because drawing from uh, our lessons in Nigeria and Uganda, we that is then the next the next step for us at the regional level to have this operational guidance. And since it is incorporated in the regional strategy, as countries review their national action plans for health security, as their countries develop their annual plans for, for health security. We want them to make sure that uh, doing a 717 is incorporated and costed in those maps, it's costed in the annual operational plan. We might have some catalytic funding to make sure that this can be can start off, but really the most critical and the most sustainable way for us to do this is to make sure that this is institution institutionalized and that we can mobilize both external and domestic financing to implement this as part and parcel of performance, performance metrics for us to moving forward uh, for preparing for the next pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Ambrose. Uh, you've also touched on some of the questions that we've had uh, in the chat around the, the financing bit as well. So thank you for that. Um, and moving to our last question for this Q&A segment is, uh, how, do, how, might we deal, how might we deal with the political barriers that compromise early response? Uh, in using 717, this might raise some new political questions. Um, what are some uh, suggestions or things that you've been thinking about at WHO? I think like Tom said in his opening remarks, 717 can be used as an advocacy tool. So it's really, for example, if ESA has found out all these challenges, I think the first is to make sure that you're raising these challenges to, 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 to the people who provide us money. And, and so first of all, raising it to the ministers of health and making sure that the ministers of health are talking to the ministers of finance and making and say if the, an outbreak is, is not detected, an outbreak is not reported or responded to, it will grow into something big and will disrupt social and economic indicators. And that's the messaging we should be saying. 717 will help us to, to nip some of these outbreaks in the bud so that they don't grow into big outbreaks, which would result in disruption of countries' economies. That's one. But we can also use 717 to talk to legislators, the social, the social affairs committees. They, they are the ones who allocate domestic financing. We've really had a couple of 
declarations from Abuja to the AU declaration on domestic financing, but we are not having a shift. And I think me as an accountability metrics, we should start using some of the results coming from 717 to be reaching out and say, hey, you see, this is, this is it. We are not doing this in seven days. We are not reporting in one day and we are not having an initial effective response in seven days. So 15 days, this is going to get out of control. And once it gets out of control, People fear when, you know, if you ask Issa now, everybody is fearing that if the Ebola outbreak expands, they will be locked down. I mean, we have to message it around. I mean, somehow with the epidemiological data, the evidence to say, you know, if, if we do this now, we will don't need to have some of these public health and social measures because we nip outbreaks in the bud with 717. So as, and we need to have some communication specialists. I know doctors are not the best communicators. So we need people who help us to market this thing and make sure that we are talking to different audiences. We are talking to politicians, but also we are talking to implementers at national and, and, and subnational level. And we are also telling our health workers and the operational guide that we use and that we are training our health workers and retraining them, especially the peripheral ones, because outbreaks start in communities and they end in communities. Thank you so much for driving home the point of how it could be a, a really powerful advocacy tool for us, for sure. Um, and today, in today's conversation, our goal was to engage a group of people. We have close to uh, 160 people on the line today. Um, and we've been able to start this initial conversation about what are the, the technical, operational, and political questions we must answer to make 717 a, 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 re, a, a reality in terms of a shared global metric for epidemic preparedness? Um, so thank you for, to all our speakers for helping make that, initiating that conversation and sharing these very concrete examples and, and helping us start to answer these big questions. Uh, what our team will be doing shortly is triaging all your questions and following up with you shortly. Um, I'll hand it over to our Senior Vice President of Prevent Epidemics, Amanda McClellan, to, to close this out. Over to you, Amanda. Uh, thank you so much, Durbin, and thank you to all the speakers. Uh, I think you've done a great job of wrapping it up already, so I, I won't take too much time, but I want to thank our partners uh, in this space. We've been working with a number of partners, including WHO, both at the Afro level and Geneva as well as Dr. Makumbi in Uganda, and as Dr. Ember said, a number of other countries that have been testing this approach, including Nigeria, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Rwanda, Ethiopia, even here in the United States of America and in Brazil. And we look forward to expanding the number of partners and countries that are testing and using the approach in the coming months. Many uh, of the lessons that we shared today are built off years of work and experience uh, using the IHR ME framework, learning in country, the timeliness metrics and evaluation tools, as well as business processes. And as you've heard, this is an approach that brings all of those pieces together and allows us to look at the system more completely and understand where the challenges are from the community level, the local uh, level, subnational and national level and communicate that both as an accountability tool, but also as a communication tool. Sometimes we have to be able to break things down in a way that's simple for our counterparts in the Ministry of Finance or, or other parts of the government system to understand what it is that we do and that speed matters. Uh, we need to find outbreaks quickly and respond to them quickly. And 717 helps us not only understand our own performance and the way that we are able to um, implement that in partnership with communities uh, on the ground, but also help us identify those challenges and clearly explain them to our counterparts in the political and financial sectors. So we continue to learn with countries and further develop the approach. As Ambrose mentioned, there's still a lot of work to be done to create the operational guidance from the regional level, as well as the global level. So this is really part and the start of a conversation that RTSL is proud to support and to continue over the coming months. We look forward to sharing uh, additional information in the coming weeks and months, especially around how we can expand the number of partners, uh, both collaborating and sharing lessons, but potentially with some additional funding. I see a number of questions coming in around funding and support for this. 
Uh, so we look forward to continuing this conversation. The team will be sharing uh, the, the videos and the slides from here and additional information in the weeks to come about how we can continue to learn, share and partner around the 717 metric uh, and approach. So with that, I want to thank everyone for their time today uh, uh, and thank our speakers very much for sharing their experience. Thank you so much for your time.